The disturbance began in the huge Anna M. Cross building on Rikers Island. It houses mainly state prisoners. It is also a maximum security facility. The trouble began as the rioting inmates began to rip up beds and other furniture to form barricades inside several of the dormitories in the huge center. Corrections officers finally restored order by using tear gas to force their way into the barricaded areas. Late this afternoon at the bridge to Rikers Island, the Corrections Commissioner, Richard Kohler, described the conditions inside the prison now. They had done extensive damage to the 12 dormitories where uh, they were removed from uh, during the night. Kohler was asked about reports that there had been another uprising this afternoon. The group of inmates that was in the dining area began to bicker and fight among themselves and they began to take apart the ceiling of the dining area. Um, the chief and his staff got them settled down. The corrections department said the building was not overcrowded last night, but some of the statistics from that department indicate that there are general problems in the system. In 1980, 48,000 inmates went through the prison system of New York. In 1987, 100,000 went through the system. It was said that this disturbance was prompted by routine security checks. Apparently, they are necessary. In November, those checks produced 101 weapons. In December, 130. In January, they found 114. Today, I spoke to a man who works with the Department of Health who goes into the Anna Cross building every day. He said it has been tense there for some time. It's not the most pleasant of places to be in. Um, uh, I would say that they, it is overcrowded to some degree. Yeah. And that would does t tend to increase tensions in the place. Yeah. It's taken an upturn at a point when we're already full. Rikers was built to house city detainees, but now it also houses tougher and more dangerous state prisoners until they can be moved to state facilities. But the state is also suffering from overcrowding. The New York State prison population has increased 100 percent since 1979. New York City's jail population has doubled since 1983. The result, an increase in violence, including two major disturbances at Rikers. In August of 1986, 45 inmates barricaded themselves in a dormitory to protest a plan to add even more prisoners to the already overcrowded population. The inmates broke up furniture to fashion weapons and threatened correction officers. Two months later, a major riot erupted. Six guards and 63 prisoners were injured in a series of confrontations. At the time, inmates blamed that situation on overcrowding. Very overcrowded. There's a lot of violators here that don't belong here. They've had several altercations in the mess hall already. One minute everything is cool, the next minute somebody's getting shanked. Anything can happen. Following the disturbance in 86, a number of guards were charged with beating inmates, but the head of the Correction Officers Benevolent Association says, Overcrowding, not abusive behavior by guards, was at the root of the problem. Most of the facilities on Rikers Island are terribly overburdened, and they're crowding them in uh, with giving inmates only 46 square feet each. The primary cause of riots in jail systems across the country is overcrowding. That is the problem that we have in the New York City jail system, and I don't think we should wait for the day after the riot to react to it. The number of guards has been increased in recent years at Rikers, but they are relatively young and inexperienced. There has also been considerable tension between guards and inmates. In 86, Kohler said the violence and the tension goes with the territory. Thousands of people are in jail, many of them there for violent crimes. Um, it's inherent uh, in jail systems to have some violence. New York City's Rikers Island has long had a reputation as one of the roughest, toughest, meanest jails in America. And in 1990-91, it lived up to that reputation with a riot, more than 2,000 inmate slashings and stabbings, and eight inmate homicides. Since this report first aired last December, New York City has appointed a new corrections commissioner who takes over at a time when things have been relatively quiet on Rikers Island. But relative quiet at this jail still means about 50 inmate slashings and stabbings a month. To listen to the inmates, you'll hear that Rikers is more dangerous than the street. And to hear the officers tell it, Rikers makes running a maximum security prison look easy. Just across the river from Manhattan, next to LaGuardia Airport, is Rikers Island. Actually, it's a complex of nine separate jails that house 15,000 inmates. And remember, this is jail, not prison. Which means that while some inmates serve brief terms here, most are just awaiting trial and cannot make bail. 
New prisoners arrive daily, and a thousand go back and forth to court each day. With an average stay of just two months, about 100,000 inmates pass through Rikers each year. But the constant turnover makes this place hard to run. Inmates enter Rikers through this receiving room. This is my jail. You don't come here to fuck around. This is You guys cut the bullshit. Right here. Cut it out. You guys play around with somebody, I'm going to be on you. I'll be on you. Veteran officers Mike Melendez and John Reyes lay down the law. Robinson, you got caught there today. I don't want you guys playing around with these guys. These guys are long. Guys mess around, I'm going to mess around. Williams Morales. When officers assign beds, they try to group inmates so that an accused shoplifter won't end up next to a murderer. Roberto Romano. But Rikers is so overcrowded, just finding a bed for an inmate can be a problem. ID card. There's no room. There's actually no room. Right now, we got 40 inmates, and we have one bed in this institution. 40 inmates, one bed? One bed. So where do they sleep? You're looking at them, Mike. You mean sitting on the benches? On the floors? And there it is. It used to be worse. Inmates slept in bullpens for up to a week until a judge ordered the city to pay prisoners $150 if they didn't get a bed within 24 hours. Let's get you stuff. 150 bucks if they don't get a bed in 24 hours? So, so uh, next, another $100 for every 12 hours that it exceeds the 24. They can wind up making more money than you make, John. Huh? They can wind up getting out of here on bail. <laughs> by us all right these guys are on their way to where x-rays they're coming back from another jail that had x-rays taken so they get pretty good health care free medical free dental they don't pay for anything three hots in a cot remember most of these men are awaiting trial they're innocent until proven guilty in a city that gives its jail population a lot of rights so they wear their own clothes keep stockpiles of fancy footwear. Even jewelry is allowed. Inmates are entitled to a six-minute daily telephone call out. But they talk longer and fights over who uses the phones are common. An inmate can even bring a Walkman from home. At meals, inmates choose Muslim, kosher, or regular. And they get daily trips to well-stocked law libraries. And all this leaves officers with an attitude. They say inmates get better treatment than they do. Officers also say these rights breed violence. So why don't you turn it in? Turn it into property, it'll be safe there, and you won't have any hassles with any other inmates. The problem is this watch. Officers Melendez and Reyes want it put in storage, but the inmate insists on keeping it. Why you want a chance getting hurt in here? Over a watch or a chain? Is it worth it? At least if it gets lost here, you're insured for it. We'll take care of it. These officers have seen new arrivals get stabbed for less. Let's go, come on. And this is what happens when there's a stabbing. A five by five, bro. In one 10-hour stretch, we watched this emergency response team gear up six times. It's the only time officers can carry weapons. Last year, there were more than 2,500 violent incidents at Rikers. Blood is a common sight. This inmate was cut in the eye and stabbed in the back while being robbed of his jewelry. 22, 23! After any violent attack, officers search the cells for weapons. In this case, they find four makeshift knives called shanks. We were told almost every inmate has one. They have plenty of weapons. They make weapons. You mean the list of shanks? shanks. I mean, we have shanks that are a foot. Reyes even told me today's inmates don't hesitate to use these weapons on officers. No man is is just going to beat up a correction officer because he knows what the dickens is going to happen to him. If he Back in the days, it used to be like that. Yeah. In the old days. Now... They'll, they'll cut an officer just as fast as they'll cut an inmate. You ever afraid in here? Honest. Every day. And Reyes' fear comes from personal experience. Last year, when a Muslim gang sought revenge against a rival, Reyes raced down this hallway with an emergency response team. We turned that corner off. All you saw was blood. Officer's blood. When I got to here, I turned around. There was nobody with me. I was in the middle of the confrontation. When they came behind me, one guy stabbed me in the eye. Stabbed you what? Stabbed me in the eye here. I caught three stitches under the eye. I hit the floor. I got stabbed in the head. I caught six stitches there. 
As I went to the ground, another inmate came behind me, stuck me twice with a nice pick from my lung. I carry this to keep to remind me of the incident. Okay? That was me in the clinic. Oh my. Oh my. Even after a brutal attack like this, officers have to follow a strict use of force policy. They can use force to stop violence, but never to retaliate. That's the rule. But not that day. Because we, officers took care of those that hurt the officers. What do you mean? They took care of business. Yeah. Top racket. And part of the racket for Officer John Manning is being ready to fight. Manning says he once wanted to help inmates, but like Officer Reyes, he too got slashed in the face, and his attitude changed. Okay. I had a liberal view at one point of thinking that, you know, they, they are God's children, yeah. but until it happens to you, until they attack you personally, then your view changes. They aren't you know? quite all God's children anymore. Definitely not. Manning works in punitive segregation, the jail within the jail. When inmates stab other prisoners or attack officers, they end up here, locked down 21 hours a day. Whenever they go out, they're strip searched. Inmates call it harassment. Manning calls it necessary. When you search guys, you pull their cheeks back. Why? You see if they have any razors in their mouth. Usually with... Wait a minute. Razors? Razors. Double-edged or single-edged razors. Which they hide in? Hide in their cheek. Cheek area, yes, in their mouth. And so you make them really... Pull it open so that you can look inside and see whether or not it's in there. They Manning also says inmates hide weapons, believe it or not, up their backside. Matter of fact, he had one inmate. He had a seven-inch, eight-inch knife. It was up his tail? Up his rectum area. And the only way that it was found is through a, an x-ray. Prisoners in punitive segregation are tightly controlled and watched. But most others are not, but especially those in dormitories. Brian Supernant, known as Soup, is an eight-year veteran officer. He is alone and unarmed with 50 inmates. He says the idleness in here breeds violence, and when it explodes, soups in the middle. What he's supposed to do is trigger his personal body alarm and then wait for that emergency team to rush to his side down this long hallway, and then this one. But there's a problem. You haven't got a gun, you haven't got a club, you got nothing except... I haven't got a body alarm. You haven't got a body alarm? What, what if somebody takes a whack at you? Well, the way things are supposed to be and the way things are, unfortunately, in the system these days aren't the exact same thing. Hey, look at the monitor that watches these hallways. Officers don't rely on this equipment. Veterans like Soup rely on their intuition. They're savvy when there's an incident. Flipping, man. Seeing things, talking to myself the whole night. We gotta, we gotta find your bed somewhere. I wanna get off this island. I wanna get off this building, period. I'm supposed to be out of here a long time ago. Don't Soup go. tries to calm an inmate with something they call IPC, interpersonal communication. Let me put the paperwork in, all right? I'll give it to the captain when he makes his tour. I'll let the captain know that uh, you wanna go see the site. But one out of three officers here are rookies. And listen to what Soup would have done as a rookie in this situation. Okay. I probably would have told him, listen, you're in jail, that's the deal, okay? You want to go in, you can walk in, or you can be made to go in, okay? And I'm not talking no IPC at the time. There is another reality at Rikers. Inmates call them their house leaders. Guys like Tony Vasquez tell other inmates what they can and cannot do. They pay him for protection and for favors. The sneakers and the jewelry are symbols of his power. What do you do with all this gold? Look, look at this four rings, gold. How come you get to wear all this jewelry? That's entirely up to the collection facility. If they don't want me to wear it, I'll send it home kindly. There's no problem with that. Mm -hmm. But as long as I can wear it, I want to live the way I want to live. With a, an inmate like that, what we have to do is try to bring him down a peg or two in the other inmate's eyes. How do you do that? talk to him a little more than everybody else, they're going to start to think, well, maybe he's telling the officer something that he shouldn't be. What would happen if another guy came in here and said, and he's tougher than you, yeah. and he says, I'm going to run this house? It's, it's, it's going to be a little battle, I guess. Who's going to battle? I guess me and him, because I don't let no one take nothing from me. 
And the battle takes place, what, fists? You got a weapon. What happened? No, I don't. Anthony. <laughs> Everybody's got a weapon. What kind of weapon you got? I don't have a weapon. I'm not gonna look, I'm not gonna search you, and I'm not gonna I'll take the Fifth Amendment on that one. Have you ever hit an officer? No. Would you ever hit an officer? No, I'm not that dumb. No, yeah, I can Why, what what happens to an inmate who hits an officer? They'll come get him, drag him into a bullpen, and he'll get the beating of his life. They'll get it. You understand that? Yes, I do. Okay, fellas, stand up for trial. Last call. Rikers has all the problems of New York City streets, only worse. This corner of Rikers is packed with inmates who would have been in state mental hospitals 20 years ago. Now they are here awaiting trial. I have the bottom of the pit in society, criminals. The guys that I get, they are like outcasts. The mental ward is Officer Ronnie Campbell's specialty. You know, when he cuffs, his food, he gives and he gets rid of it. So this is a, that's what he used for a cup and he used his hands for food, for food. Is it as dangerous for you in here as it is for some of the other officers out with the general population? It is. It is because these guys here can go off their rock at any given moment without a warning. In fact, earlier this year, one mental ward inmate smashed another over the head with a chair and killed him. And Campbell himself just recovered from a leg bite. He is a counselor, a nurse, and a master of the fine art of bribery. But some inmates won't take care of their most basic needs without a push. This time, Campbell trades a cigarette for a shower. Dad, I got your cigarette right here. You see it, right? You don't do a good job, you don't get your cigarette. You ain't gotta hurry up. You got a lot of time. Take your time. Very good, very good. Excellent. Come on. Campbell says that inmates on his cell block sometimes stay here for years, locked away, waiting to be found fit for trial. Meantime, New York City plans to stuff yet a thousand more inmates into this overcrowded island at the end of LaGuardia's runways. Rikers Island. It is a scary, violent, lonesome place.